Welcome, everyone, to our first lecture of fall 2018. Um, it's really a wonderful pleasure to be here this evening to welcome Evan Sharp back to the school. As the co-founder of Pinterest, Evan certainly does not need an introduction. Today, there are 75 billion pins on over 1 billion boards on Pinterest, and more than 200 million people come to the platform each month to explore and experience more than 100 billion ideas. Here at GSAP, we like to think that some of his time here helped a little to <laughs> open the door for this inspiring trajectory. He met Ben Silverman, Pinterest CEO and fellow co-founder, through a mutual friend while at GSAP, and rumors have it that they began work on Pinterest as a side project in between the end of the school semester and Evans moving to San Francisco to work for Facebook. There are also further rumors that have contributed to his becoming somewhat of a legend for us here at the school, that he may have hacked a very large and well-known museum's database while he was here, <laughs> that his studio project on the question of the archive may have enabled seeds of ideas to form, and that the friendships, collegiality, and conversations we strive to enable and foster here at the school may have somehow opened up new possibilities for his imagining something Pinterest-like as an extension of his thinking through the visual field and production, as well as consumption of images that architecture in great part is, and certainly has incre increasingly become. Beyond those rumors, there are a few key aspects that Evan shared with me earlier today about his time here. A work ethic developed through the intense working hours we often indulge in as time stretches very late in studio, an ability to work with uncertainty and a large number of variables giving them shape through the design process, and a unique kind of image and visual literacy as we learn to think through images and produce new ones as a way to think through the world and reimagine its possibilities. With Pinterest, Evans' work and trajectory outlined a new possible and very tangible path for how we continue to expand forms of practice, bringing design intelligence and thinking, data visualization and aesthetic sensibility together in a new way, and towards the reinvention of the everyday, a project very much anchored in architecture and as architecture since modernism. But today, and moving beyond Pinterest, we're excited to have Evan with us to share some of his broader and more open-ended thoughts, you know, such as maybe how technology can open up new dreamscapes for us as we strive to imagine a different and more creative and sustainable future, or how we can strive to render technology more centered on the human experience, how we can use it to diversify and expand that experience, how we can imagine giving new kinds of embedded depth to images, to tell more stories across more contexts and more cultures. And more importantly, how we can strive through creative practices to lead, lead more creative lives through making and design, but also through a certain kind of optimism in these darker times, where new ideas and old technologies and old ideas and new technologies can be brought to intersect in unexpected ways again to produce new possible meanings, new ways of sharing, of living, of working, and of being together somehow on this planet. So please uh, join me in welcoming Evan Sharp. Hello. Thank you for coming. Um, those rumors are actually all true. Uh, it's very true that the uh, Pinterest was built because I really needed inspiration for studio, and I was too lazy to walk down the stairs to the library or the slide library, and I was really frustrated I couldn't just search online and find images, and so we created a, a product to bookmark them. And it turns out we built that for ourselves, and then you know, so many other people wanted to use the same functionality. But I'm actually not gonna talk a lot about Pinterest today. I hope that's not disappointing. I do that all the time for the last seven to eight years, and I really enjoy talking about Pinterest, but I thought today it could be really fun for me actually to talk about architecture and building. Um, because I've experienced those the last seven or eight years as, I guess, a client and as an occupant. And I thought it'd be fun for me, maybe not for you, but for me, to share some of those thoughts. So before I start, I just wanted to thank Amale and GSAP and all the staff here for having me and making it so easy for me to come and, and share my thoughts and being so gracious. Thank you. All right. 
So this talk is about 15 parts. Some of them are short, some of them are long. If it's too long and you want to go or go to the bathroom, please get up, it won't be offended. Um, it's not a very linear talk. There's not going to be clear takeaway, but I do hope some of the ideas are interesting or inspirational and that you can take some of those and play with them over the next year. The, talk of my, uh, the, the name of my talk is Home is a Garden, and I'm going to start with a section called The Garden and the Shed. It's a very simple comparison. All right. The mason sees the plan and lays the bricks and dries the mortar and puts on the roof, and then the mason is done. What a beautiful shed. And the gardener mends the soil and plants the seeds and supplies the water and the sun and sees what grows. And then the gardener weeds and tends and protects and works with the, the cycle of life. And as architects, I think, um, we tend to relate to things professionally like masons. And actually, in my experience talking to people who use Pinterest, we relate to a lot of things in our lives like the mason, like we're building a shed, like we see sort of an image of an endpoint and then we work towards that endpoint, build towards it brick by brick until we're done. We diet that way until we hit a target weight or we exercise until we run a certain distance or we work until we hit a certain income. And in our heads, we'll reach that goal and finish the shed and check it off the list. And that's kind of in contrast to the garden, which is never finished. Gardens are interactive and dynamic. You don't grow them directly, you just create the conditions for growth and then you intervene by pruning and fertilizing and watering. Gardens are never finished. They're ritualized and have seasons. They're responsive to forces outside of our control and they thrive in balance and they die if things are out of balance. And they grow out of that magical substance of soil, which is my favorite architectural material because you just leave it alone, shit grows out of it. It's amazing, it's like this anti-entropic material. And to me, that kind of relationship is an ongoing relationship versus the shed, which is an object relationship. We think of sheds or buildings three-dimensionally, and we think of gardens four-dimensionally. And my limited experience, if we approach some of the more important things in life, more like a gardener, the self, the family, the body, the profession, the finances, the, the relationships in our lives, and more, uh, instead of as the mason, if we can create those moments and rituals that enable us to kind of feel that achievement we get on an ongoing basis when we garden, it brings, in, brings things into balance, which is quite a, a radical improvement. Because the only real difference here between the two, actually, is that we sort of default to the garden with a relationship that treats that garden with reverence. Because we see gardens as alive. And even though that's kind of an unconscious thing, it changes everything. And I garden quite a lot, if you can't tell, quite obsessed with plants right now. But even when I garden, I'm not consciously thinking about, oh, the dignity of the garden or something deep like that. But to me, that's kind of weird, actually. It's, it's a sign that I'm missing something, maybe missing a basic spiritual practice. Because I approach my garden kind of emotionally and intellectually and physically, but not spiritually. Like you see a flower broom or, or you grow a, a vine up a trellis and that's very emotional or you dig in the dirt and that's very physical, or you think about the soil and the sun and that's very intellectual. But if I really want to connect to my garden in a way that nourishes my deepest self, I need to consider the spirit of the garden and by extension, my own spirit. All right, number two, Dear Building at White Sulphur Springs. In architecture school, I was taught that the measure of the quality of a building is how well it's designed, its structure and its form, and how well those things relate to its intended use. And when I first met you, I was not impressed. You look like an old abandoned rehab facility with chip wood paneling and cliche motivational posters and the worst ugly brown carpeting I've ever seen. But this week, you reminded me that buildings have spirits too, spirits that are comprised of impressions left by all the souls that have gone within. And that the measure, a great measure, of the quality of a building are the lives that have been lived, the jobs that have been performed, and the transformations undergone within. And that if you want to make a great building, you actually don't have to know architecture. You just have to know how to love yourself and love your neighbor. And by this measure, you are one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. Much love, 
heaven. All right, number three, not modernists. I feel a kindred with the modernists, with the kind of optimism they felt and the way they repurposed all that military technology, put them towards living, you know, with the manifestos and the images. And I think it's probably because they were working in a, on the edge of a, of a big tech revolution, like we are today, and that speaks to me through, through time. And so recently I Googled what are the greatest modernist houses, because I was trying to educate myself. And Google said the top five are Falling Water, The Glass House, The Farnsworth House, Via Savoy, is that right? Close enough. And the Eames House. <laughs> I do speak German, but it's not that useful. Now, as famous buildings, as they primarily impact our lives through images, I next took each one of these houses and searched for representative images and studied each using Wikipedia and Pinterest and Google, as we do. And I think you probably know all these houses, but I'm going to go through them anyway. Farnsworth House, designed by Mies van der Rohe in Illinois, as a weekend retreat in which the client could engage in hobbies of violin and poetry and nature. And he said of his design, if you view nature through the glass walls of the Farnsworth House, it gains a more profound significance than if viewed from the outside. That way more is said about nature, becomes part of a larger whole. All right, the glass house, uh, derived from the Farnsworth House, designed by Philip Johnson as his own residence in Connecticut. He lived there for 58 years, passed away in 2005. Falling Water, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in Pennsylvania, near where I grew up, as a weekend home in which the client could escape the heat and smoke of Pittsburgh to swim in the water and collect modern art. And Wright said of his building, I think you can hear the waterfall when you look at the design. And the one I can't pronounce, Via Savoie, by La Courbusier, there you go, outside Paris, in France. Designed as a country home in which the inhabitants could retreat by car from the business of the city, the realization of his maxim, the house should be a machine for living. And finally, the Eames home. Originally sketched out by Charles Eames and Aero Saarinen and then re-sketched and perfected by Charles and Ray Eames after they'd spent years visiting the site as their own residence in Pacific Palisades, basically Los Angeles, California. Something strange happens when you get to images of the Eames house. Like the others, we see kind of these perfect modernist lines and building materials hitting natural materials, but at the same time, it's a different feeling entirely. This image was taken in the Eames house the night they moved in, and I, I think it's hauntingly beautiful. This is a photo of children playing with a toy system that they designed. And you, as you look at some of these images, a pattern starts to emerge. So of images of the building as a place of practice, of the house as a home, images of interiors, of creativity, of people, of love, Images of a life uh, well lived. Not really a space occupied by a clean aesthetic, but a space occupied by, by life, by living. And even though the Eames designed and filled their home with some of the most emblematic objects in the modern age, for me at least, the Eames house is not a symbol of modern architecture, but of how to bring old ways of living and knowing into the modern world. And I think it's a mistake to assume that those objects were the point for them. And so the images that the Eames tended to capture of their home show a three-dimensional object, the house, through which they extruded a four-dimensional quality of living. Their home was not really an object to be occupied or used. It felt, to me at least, looking at his images, more like a, an instrument to be played. Life being a musical thing, after all. So how is it that a modernist home speaks to me the most when it was created by someone who wasn't, they weren't really architects, arch artists and a designer, you know, they didn't design a three-dimensional home, they really designed a four-dimensional home, and that's to me because the Eames aren't modernists. Rather, they're the prototype of this next generation, I think us, of designers. Whether they knew it or not, my perspective is the Eames paved the way for us to now address some of the most acute problems in our culture. That we've lost a lot of the tools we once had to nourish ourselves and the practices of living well every day. There are architects who draw houses all around us, it's hard to find the architects that draw homes. And I don't think it's a coincidence, I just went there a few weeks ago, that of all those houses, this is the only one I could find 
occupied by people who had, at least by all appearances, a personal applied interest in plants. <laughs> all right, number four, park ranger. My parents met in 1975 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on the front steps of this building, Independence Hall, where this country was born. They were both employees of the National Park Service, working at Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell during the bicentennial, the 200th birthday of the United States of America. And I feel like I have to run for political office one day just so I can use that story <laughs> as full as potential. My father was a park ranger. He'd worked at the Grand Canyon and a few other parks before ending up as a ranger at Independence Hall. <laughs> He's really proud of this, by the way. He's very proud. And my mother was a museum curator and an archaeologist. Um, and you know, later on in my life, we moved from Philadelphia up to Massachusetts, where she worked at, at Minuteman National Historic Park, another kind of revolutionary war park. And I'm, I'm actually proud of this heritage that my childhood is linked with the physical remnants of what's a pretty incredible fact, that this country was founded on an ethical declaration of human rights. And despite all the hypocrisy of the founding fathers and our failures to live up to that, ethical declaration. I'm still very grateful to live in a system that's trying to make progress all the time towards this vision, and that's rooted in a story and a desire that all people are created equal. Now, later in college, I met my wife, Christina. I'll never forget the first time I took a ride in her car. I didn't have a car. She did. That was pretty great. Um, <laughs> all her doors were stuffed full of these National Park brochures she'd been collecting on our cross-country road trips. That was really, it was a good thing for me. Um, and I've been collecting these brochures as well, so it was like, what's going on with this woman? <laughs> and now that we're married, our rule is we can only collect the National Park brochures when we visit a park. And looking back, I'm realizing more and more as I get a little bit older how much my parents being in the park service, or at least that story, has influenced my interests in history and architecture and the natural <laughs> world and design. It was only recently that I realized who, how influential the visual language of the National Park Service has been in my own language or, or journey as a designer. Here we go, one of these classic mid-century systems, National Park Service Unigrid system, designed by Massimo Vignali in 1977, still in use over 40 years later. His designs included a system of publication sizes, grids, typography, illustration and photographic standards, and more all with the intent of reducing costs for the Park Service, as well as creating a unified organizational image. And altogether, his design language serves as a sort of visual framework that encompasses many of this nation's most treasured places, from the White House to sites of great historical tragedy, to natural wonders out west, grassland, forest, jungle, desert. His simple system encompasses them all, sort of the diverse geographical and historical topography of the nation, unified by a visual system, presenting a unified organizational image, not just of the Park Service, but in many ways of the nation itself. Curated, bounded, organized, systematic, clean, understood, mediated. Sort of nature's most awesome forces, mediated by an information layer. All right, number five, headquarters. Pinterest has had many headquarters over the last eight years. I'll start it here, 2009, after just having accepted a job offer at Facebook and taken a leave from, from uh, GSAP in my three months. This is their myth. Who knew? Between um, quitting GSAP or taking leave and moving out to California to work at Facebook, I used my time off to code a passion project with my buddy Ben. It's called Pinterest. First year, nobody used it. Years after that, it got really big. And the very first instantiation was built out of this apartment on the 103rd in Central Park West. And also out of this coffee shop in the Whole Foods, which was brand new at the time. Thank God that was there. Probably built half the site in that one chair. I remember it by the window. Coffee was too expensive, but it made it do. All right, next headquarters, 2010. Coding Pinterest out of an apartment in Palo Alto that we shared with another startup. There's two startups in one crappy apartment, and two of the guys were living in the apartment. It was not very pleasant, but we made it work. Front yard was our main conference room, and also our social gathering area. Lots of programming. 
And then our backyard was our backup conference room. <laughs> it's a true story. Right now. Yeah, <laughs> you want to see what it looks like day to day. It's kind of what it looks like. Yeah, it's day to day. <laughs> yeah. All right, 2011. We moved into a space with actual commercial zoning. It's quite a feat. Although it was in Palo Alto, so we had to wine and dine this landlord to even get a shot at it, but he was an architect, and so he gave us the lease. It was a 10-year lease. Palo Alto is insane. And we quickly grew into that home. Despite or perhaps because of the playful atmosphere, we built many of the most formative ideas in this office. We quickly filled the seating area, we filled the conference area. One day, this woman walked in, didn't know who she was. She looked pretty weird until we realized it was Halloween and she dressed as Pinterest. And the big thing with startups is learning from failure, so what we learned here is time to get some security on the door. <laughs> True story. Pretty soon we knocked the wall down, dividing that space from the one next door, and moved in, but it wasn't long before we filled both of those spaces, and so we had to move again. 2012, running out of space in Palo Alto, we needed more room, but Palo Alto was also running out of office space, so we turned our eyes to San Francisco, which at the time was a fraction of the cost, like a fifth the cost of Palo Alto, and you could take the train to work, that was pretty great. And we were getting a bit older as a company, we quickly filled this space. Wasn't quite grown up yet. Uh, that's a pneumatic powered Nerf gun. I'll skip the part where you get shot in the face. We hired more and more people who could, of course, code until we filled this space as well. And it was time to move again. So the good news is 2013, time for a new space. That space was 808 Brannon. It's kind of a warren of a building. And we'd actually had that space the whole time we were in the last space, about nine months. We use it for Frisbee games, and this is Ben, our CEO, driving a scooter around. And it was actually the first time we had a chance to do a build-out. Um, so I actually hired my first semester studio GSAP prof, Jeanette Kim, to do something for us cheap <laughs> on a small budget. It was amazing. She used some very minimal moves. It was the tiniest amount of money you can imagine, but she did a great, a great job. Uh, just enough of an intrusion on the monolithic floor plates. And it, man, this building actually really worked really well. So this is sort of some screenshots, or sorry, some photos, of what it looked like in the end. When we moved in, the building seemed enormous. We used to stare at it before we moved in, we're like, crap. We're gonna, it was kind of unimaginable that we were able to fill the building. But fill we did. Um, it's, it's actually been sort of a dream the entire time that we knew would come true, which is a really weird feeling. It was the first place, this building, 808, that we were able to grow into for more than a year. It had great sectional qualities. Great social energy. The patina and architectural metaphors were everywhere you looked. It's true, they blow that model's hair with fan continuously. It's totally crazy, They'd, I'd be sick all the time. We celebrated hitting 100 million users. The building was great because it was kind of small enough you could see all the way across, but not so big you didn't still know everybody, at least for a while. So it wasn't long before we needed more space, and that was two blocks down, 2015, 651 Brandon Street, this was the largest office yet, and the first time we had real money. Not a lot, not a lot, but enough money. So I put that money towards the design, and I hired a small local firm I'd always respected, Iwamoto Scott. It seemed like they were the kind of people who had a lot more talent than opportunities to date, and I felt like they could do a phenomenal job. Also, a friend of mine, who I think might be here, Shah, had interned there. The building itself had been a John Deere factory. I'll skip all the metaphors here. And it was a showroom. And Iwamoto Scott did a beautiful job using cheaper materials in a way that looks really expensive. 
And they built this sort of factory for inspiration, but that's in real life. And we quickly moved in and made this space our own space. And if the early, if the last office had felt sort of like the early craft user base of Pinterest, this office felt more like an international company, the one we were becoming. And we won a lot of awards for the renovation, AI Medal of Honor, California Medal of Honor, Architizer Award. But not long after we moved in here, actually a week after we moved in, we had to be finishing design on our next building, thanks to the crazy real estate market in San Francisco. And that building was 505 Brandon, which we just moved into this year, retaining 808 Brandon and 651 Brandon. It was the first building we occupied that had been built from the ground up, although we didn't get to design the structure of the building itself, we got to do the interiors. We've only been there a few months, so it's still kind of a work in progress, and I don't have a ton of photos, but I'll share the architect's photos. One thing I insisted on, uh, echoing Amale's work, was plunging a staircase down through all six floors to get people circulating sectionally. It's awesome, actually. I totally recommend it. <laughs> Still quite a bit of play. They were building a Lego Millennium Falcon the day I left to come out here. And there's a spectacular view. So we'll see where this home takes Pinterest. And award season is just starting, but we've won a few already. We just won the Architizer A Plus Jury and People's Choice Award. And so I wanted to mention those awards. What has this experience taught me? I don't really know yet, but growing up, I moved around the US quite a bit, so I'm pretty comfortable changing homes, but still, the speed of the internet, pretty crazy, doesn't leave much time for gardening. But I feel very grateful that we've had the opportunity to shape our own spaces. And as great as these spaces are, and as beautiful as they look, it seems to me as the client, that there's actually not that much of a connection between how good the space is for working, and how good the space looks in the photos, and how good the space is, or how likely the space is to be recognized by awards. Kind of it's the, it seems to be the aesthetic of the space, the photography of the, the aesthetic of the photography of the space that wins the awards, and much less about the building functions, much less of how environmentally it's, it's doing, what it's doing to service the business. And in a weird way, my favorite building is actually 808 Brandon. It was the building that was large enough for a big team, but kind of small enough to know everybody. It was the building we lived in the longest. The building our employees actually put the stamp on the most. And there's actually one thing I could name that has made the biggest difference about how the building feels as a company. I think it's been the extent to which the people who work in this space have felt empowered day to day to put their own stamp on the interior. Even though the functionality of this building is horrible, the lighting is disastrous, and the HVAC is so loud you can't hear people talk. But the spirit of the building, to me, burns the brightest. All right, number six, I am embodied. I want to switch the whole tone of this talk for a few minutes to the self. Some of you won't follow me. That's totally fine. Maybe I'm crazy. I'm going to introduce this by playing a clip from the Bay Area philosopher, Alan Watts. I've always been tremendously interested in what people mean by the word I, because it comes out in curious lapses of speech. We don't say, I am a body. We say, I have a body. And somehow we don't seem to identify ourselves with all of ourselves. We say sort of my feet, my hands, my teeth, as if there was something somehow outside me. And as far as I can make out, most people feel that they are something or other about halfway between the ears and a little way behind the eyes inside the head number seven frontier americans have always been seduced by the tale that they are seduced by the lore of the frontier a frontier is defined as the area near or beyond a boundary the zone just beyond civilization where one can't depend on a safety net 
or the zone where two cultures meet. And the frontiers in our culture today are unsurprisingly kind of epic multimedia experiences, like the frontier of the deep sea, which uh, is a frontier we're still discovering, let alone understanding. Or the frontier of the tiny world of particle physics, which now somehow is in our cultural imagination because it's become itself an epic multimedia experience. We are or space, the final frontier. But is it really? The great frontier of our age is not any of these. Rather, it's the way we experience and relate to our emotional, physical, and spiritual selves. The great frontier of our age is the journey within. Everyone has a frontier inside of them. But unlike these other frontiers, that frontier is invisible, seen only through its effects, never directly, and without images, how are we supposed to know what we're doing with this frontier? And without measurable data, how are we supposed to know it with science? And without science, how are we supposed to talk about it without being crazy? But to me, the very fact that this frontier isn't visual or understood by science makes it absolutely essential that we focus our creativity on opening it up and understanding it. Because whatever you care about, government, science, Poverty, identity, business, design, buildings. Underlying the form and substance of every human domain is human behavior, how we act. Underlying all human behavior are the intellectual, emotional, physical, and spiritual dynamics in play in all of us. So all of our society and all of our government is built on the backs of the health of our citizens' relationships with themselves. And it's in, and it's in full embrace of the intellect. Our culture has really lost, I think, a lot of its technology it's lost its tools and its frameworks and rituals for interacting with, knowing, regulating, and living from the self. We've really lost touch with the technology that enabled us to fully immerse ourselves in the inner sensory experience of being alive. Technology in general enables us to move faster and more knowledgeably over land and air and sea, to traverse and get to know these mediums in much richer ways. So why is the same not true for the self? Where is the technology that connects us to ourselves? I was telling Amale that I cut my finger a couple weeks ago and I put a Band-Aid on it, and I was really happy I had a Band-Aid. And then I felt really angry at somebody at work. And it was all me. And I was like, why is there not a Band-Aid when I feel really angry? And the answer is, there could be. We just haven't built it yet. So the question for us is, how are we going to get people to care about this inner frontier if we cannot see it or cannot experience it? as a multimedia extravaganza. Or as Mr. Rogers says, We need to help our children become more and more aware that what is essential in life is invisible to the eye. We need to help our children become more... Okay. Number eight, vision. This is a von Neumann computer diagram of a human, our inputs and our outputs. If you zoom, zoom in on in our sensory inputs, we of course have the five traditional senses, as well as a multitude of non-traditional senses. And of course, of these inputs, vision is by far the most dominant. Five times more of our cerebral cortex is devoted to processing visual sensory information than the next closest sense, which is touch. In other words, a picture is worth a thousand words. And this is why our most powerful technologies are built to output information visually, in other words, screens, to match our most dominant input, vision. Now here's the thing, we're very, very good at inputting visual information, but we are incapable as machines of outputting visual information. What I can see right now, I cannot show to you using the tools and technologies I was born with. So for example, if I was gonna envision a house in all its detail and try to tell you about it, I could use a thousand words and you still wouldn't get more than a fraction of its essence. A thousand words cannot fully describe a picture. So in order to, dis in order to output visual information as beings, to close the gap between what we see and what we can represent to others, we've developed technology, technology of paint, technology of figuration, 
technology of photography, technology of the internet. This is a Van Neumann diagram of a smartphone. And the smartphone camera, of course, has created whole new ways of capturing and censoring the world. Let's look at the inputs of the phone. The dominant computing input over time has evolved. First the punch card, then the keyboard, then the mouse, and now the multi-touch screen, mostly driven by Apple. And recently, computing devices have had a rapidly evolving list of sensing inputs you don't think about. Camera, microphone, geolocation, accelerometer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the camera, of course, in particular, has been a revolution. It's given us a tremendous ability to represent and visualize what we see for other people. We now take three to 10 photos per day per person, primarily to save memories, otherwise to save images we once saw. And we're really still using the smartphone camera a lot like we used analog cameras. But the smartphone hasn't just given people cameras, it's given them network cameras. That's what social media is, networked cameras. But there's another revolution coming. The camera is poised to become not just a photography tool, but creepily enough, an eyeball attached not just to a brain that can save memories, but a brain that's networked and that can use its computational power to derive meaning from what it sees. The impact of this will be unbelievably massive. For Pinterest, I'll just say that soon, digitally, images and visuals won't just be a lean back browsing experience, but they'll be the beginning of a journey and active discovery experience. And so in a way, for the first time in human history, what we're doing is gaining this ability to speak fluently in the language of visual information. That fidelity is that begin to approach what we can see. So how will we use this new language? What are we going to articulate? Number nine is identity. For much of the last century, how we label ourselves has typically been defined by inherited attributes, articulated by choosing from a pre-constructed label like race or nationality or gender or sexuality or age. So in other words, I'm a white American male, heterosexual millennial, barely a millennial. Um, and these types of identity have been typically considered something you're born into. But of course, not all identity is inherited that way. Some of it is self-determined. Just as an example, religion or subculture, political affiliation, occupation. And these can change over time. So in 2000, you might have said that I was Protestant, goth, conservative student. Maybe not someone you would want to met. And then in 2010, you might, you might have said that I was an agnostic, hipster, liberal architect. A little more your style. Or maybe today you'd say that I'm a confused, 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 confused. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because I think we're in the midst of a radical change in how identity is articulated. Culture is very much the stuff of which identity is formed, the more culture you encounter, the more specifically you can articulate who you are. And today that's increasingly happening, given the internet, with music and with this new visual language that we've given ourselves. We're using this power to construct much more granular and, con and confusing identities than those pre-constructed labels we used to see. And if the great frontier of our age is the journey within, right now what I see at work is that the spirit of the age, especially with the younger generations, is the construction of our own fluid self out of the multimedia language of culture. For we as humans are always and always becoming someone else, someone we weren't before, someone we never saw coming. And what we find, and when we find something that we love, it reveals something about who we are. And in doing so, it reveals whole new worlds to us as well. All right, number 10, disruption. Oh, I live in California. California is the land of disruption. Geologic disruption. Economic disruption. Cultural disruption. Sci-fi disruption. It is illogical. And California is, of course, the edge of the old American frontier. In, 14, in 1542, at contact, 300 dialects of approximately 100 distinct languages resonated across California's myriad landscapes. And the first European explorers, trappers, and missionaries entering California were lucky to see the state as it had existed for millennia before, 
And the image they painted in all of their journal entries and letters back home was that of a wild Eden. It seemed to them that there was no country in the world as well supplied by nature with food for man as California. Every early visitor that I could find reading some books left records to this effect. It was, in fact, a land of superlatives. There are hundreds of thousands of seals and sea lions and millions of salmon spawning in thousands of miles of freshwater habitat and oceanic schools of fish so dense they couldn't row boats through them. And the whales, well, hopefully you know what happened to the whales. And inland, it was much the same. California was a massive flower garden with wildflower prairies that stretched hundreds of miles unbroken across the rolling coastal hills and Great Central Valley and Sierra Nevadas. John Muir dubbed the state the Pacific Land of Flowers. And the forests were crazy. The largest, the tallest, and the oldest trees on Earth are still in California, many older than all of Western civilization. In the White Mountains in Eastern California, there stands today a pine tree that's over 5,000 years old. There were millions of migratory birds that covered the plains like snow. Tool elk in the Central Valley that came in herds that rivaled the size of Africa's Serengeti. Jaguars and wolves and grizzlies, all of which are now extinct. And the California that was encountered by the first Europeans just over 200 years ago was an altogether different place from where they came. Europe had been relatively degraded for centuries. Its wild lands deforested, mined, planted with, with crops, and grazed by sheep and cattle. But California, in contrast, was an untouched natural paradise for man. The writer and traveler Baynard Taylor wrote, in his, wrote his fiance from California in 1849 how much California impressed him as a wilderness, wilderness like some new created world. And John Muir, of course, helped birth the modern environmental movement by writing imagery similar to what I just shared. It's a movement that has successfully preserved half a billion acres of land as wilderness. And Muir was very much an early proponent of the view we still generally hold today, that much of California was pristine and untouched wilderness before the arrival of Europeans, sort of nature in its natural state. But there is a great tragedy here, and it's a tragedy and a trauma that permeates to the very bones of the state today. For what Muir was really seeing when he looked at Yosemite and the Central Valley and all those hundreds of acres of wildflowers were really the gardens of the Miwok and Yokuts. They were lands that had been modified and made productive by the native inhabitants for 10 centuries or more. Sorry, 10 millennia or more. And what John Muir and those early Cal Euro Europeans didn't have the cultural context to see was that the abundant California they were encountering, far from untouched wilderness, was in fact the product of millennia of close human stewardship. That until about 150 years ago, almost every square mile of California was hand tended, tilled, sowed, burned, and harvested, and in turn over the millennia creating an enormous larder of tremendous economic and biological wealth that enabled the conquering European and Asian farmers and ranchers and entrepreneurs to imagine themselves as having built a civilization out of the natural and unpeopled wilderness. And this kind of contemporary concept of California, and actually the whole country, as an unspoiled and raw and inhabit uninhabited nature, a sort of wilderness, really erases the cultural balance and harmony, not perfect harmony, but harmony, the indigenous cultures had achieved. And in a way, it erases an achievement I think a lot of the people in this room are probably chasing now, whether we're aware of it or not. It's that achievement of building a society it's much more knit into the natural systems that enable and sustain all of the life on the planet. A balance of its government, its technology, its culture, and its nature. And interestingly, it's my understanding, having read several books, that the native California peoples often use the word or their equivalent of the word wilderness as a negative label for land that has not been taken care of by humans for a long time. James Rust, a Miwok elder, was quoted as saying in the late 1880s, the white, the white man sure ruined this country. It's turned back to wilderness. And all of this has been, it's been haunting me ever since I learned about it. I wasn't sure why at first, but now I realize it was sort of the original California disruption. It is such a direct and devastating transformation of the founding myth of the landscape, from an act of heroism and virtue and civilization 
to one of pretty unimaginable trauma at the genetic level, one that still reverberates almost unconsciously every day. Thankfully, we're much more aware than ever of the great human traumas in the history of this country and the ones that are still ongoing, but I think we're much less aware of the history of the uncountable traumas we inflict on the natural world. Did you know that when a bison dies, typically the other, the other bison in the herd gather around it, which makes them relatively easy to hunt, and that the animal that was the most important animal to the pre-European society in a lot of North America went from numbering 30 million or more in 1800 to less than 100 in 1880. Did you know that the water line, the aquifer line in the Great American Prairie, used to sit right at the surface for much of the year, every gully kind of brimming with liquid? Did you know this thought that before engines kind of roared through the ocean, that the song of the blue whale, which is here sped up 10 times so that we can hear it, resonated on a deep and ancient frequency, and that it's thought it used to carry across the entire Pacific Ocean. That our technology has driven us to become the sort of unwitting arbiters of destruction of an ancient culture. That the ocean itself could have been once this big, continuous, interweaving harmonic symphony of the mammalian vocalizations of the largest animal to ever have existed in the history of the world. This idea that culture is a domain exclusive to humans is utterly absurd. And this idea that you can create meaningful change in the world without disrupting something is simply wrong. The world we are born into as humans is by default normal to us. And then as we live, it changes, occasionally in profound and occasionally in tragically irrevocable ways. And the next generation that's born just has no idea what's been lost. Although it seems to me that our bodies carry these losses and traumas, we experience them on an almost cellular level that our entire society today is experiencing a sort of collective, cellular, spiritual neuroticism, and that our body, our body knows as we move through the environment that we've lost something great, even if we're not conscious of what that is or that we feel that way. And it seems to me that our culture is sometimes built on a fundamental error about what makes people happy and fulfilled. And I'm not saying our culture is bad, I think I love our culture, but we've somehow lost one of the most basic things there is, that the point of life is to continuously experience the utter rapture of being alive, to live in a way that physically resonates with the spiritual energy lying inside each of us right now, and that any meaningful change we make to the world is likely to be source of both great new beauty as well as traumatic loss. That there is no birth without death in life or in technology or in the built environment. And what matters is that we try as hard as we can to make the changes we do make as carefully as possible and as sensitively as possible to the balance that we have today in the world. And that we codify the lessons we learn about how to do that well in the myths we pass along to the next generation. All cultures will be founding myths that help people make sense of what is good and bad. I grew up in the cradle of the post-war American myth in a society built on the spoils of being kind of the only scathed, unscathed power after World War II. But as we know, the industrial myth in the United States, at least, is unraveling, disrupted from within, the same way that the pre-industrial agrarian myth of living on the farm was disrupted in the early 20th century by factories and industry. And that disruption, of course, enabled autocrats to gain power in Europe and much of Asia. And back then, those autocrats worked up their populace by promising to take them back to the old agrarian society to live on the farm. And now that the industrial area is largely his history in the United States, thanks to globalization and automation, and there is no going back, now that technology has moved us into a post-industrial information era, today's wannabe leaders are repeating the same pattern, only now the idealized past is, of course, one of factories and industrial might, rather than agrarian might. But that's on us, because we have not yet offered up the next myth to our society to get them excited about what we're building. Where's the positive myth of the information age to help guide and direct all of our progress and ensure it's trying to head somewhere good? So far, what I see, at least sitting in San Francisco, is that the only myth that's really strong in the information is the myth of disruption. All right, number 11, connection. 2009, I was sitting up in Avery, working in housing studio. I got an email from Facebook, which is a startup at the time, asking me if I wanted to interview. They found my portfolio online. 
to be a product designer, which I didn't know what that meant. But then surprisingly, I realized I was interested. So I flew out to interview. My friend Brian, housing studio, made me this custom motivational collage. Uh, and just like that, I got the job. And a lot of what drew me to Facebook at the time was the mission. Facebook's mission for the first many years was to make the world more open and connected. And to me, that's a really, it's an incredible artifact of history. And there's good and bad parts of it. To make implying it's going to happen whether the world wants it to or not. And connected implying that we'll be building vital infrastructure for the world. Kind of like plumbers. But the problem, I think, with the internet right now is that unlike plumbers, with social sharing platforms, you know, we're plumbers who struggle to know whether the pipes we're connecting are carrying fresh water or raw sewage. Back when I was a child in the mid-1980s, you could turn on the TV and you'd see this. It was the pattern that the station broadcast when it ran out of video. Can you imagine running out of video these days? No. <laughs> that was life in broadcast culture. And in broadcast culture, there are a few dozen voices you could tune into that kind of shape the myth or story of what was happening in society. And obviously today we're living emphatically in a network culture where we can kind of access any information we want or any voices validating whatever we think. And it's a culture that's, you know, in theory empowered us with tools to tell our own story and reach a mass audience. And the positive side is there's an enormous diversity of perspectives that now can speak out that had never been heard. People who are finding a voice for the first time in our society. It's also allowing us to stay in touch with family and friends and choose what music we want Listen to, enter, listen to on the plane, watch entertainment. But of course, like any change, there's positive and negative. So where, where there were once a few dozen voices shaping the story of what's happening, there are now millions of conflicting voices of very variable quality and integrity. And the responsibility in network culture of vetting the quality of those voices you're hearing is falling to the viewer today, who rarely has the time, sometimes not even the inclination or capability to do that work, even if they wanted to. And so the downside to that is that there were a lot of people who've been empowered who are wrong, uneducated, intolerant, who are negative actors, who have a really uh, specific agenda they're trying to force through the, the population. It's also led to fragmented myths, right? We no longer have a single myth or myths in the United States. And that leads to tribalism. And without united myths, it's near impossible to galvanize the whole around a clear story or a vision for the future or a shared dream of how to use all this new technology to make sure the change it's bringing is balanced. All right, China. Now I'd like to look at a, something pretty extreme, but terrifyingly real. It's, a, it's an example of internet uh, technology motivating you to behave not in ways that align with who you are, but in ways that align you with the interests of the state and those in power. 2014, the government of China publicly announced with the construction of what's called its state-run social credit system. And when finished in 2020, the system is going to be administered by both private companies and the government of China. It will be mandatory for every citizen of China. And once implemented, every citizen will have a score that is based on data harvested from both public and private sources. And citizens, and actually companies as well, are going to be rewarded or punished on the basis of how their behavior aligns or not with the rules set out by those corporations and government. And that may sound, some of you, like a futuristic nightmare, but it's literally already here. Wired reported earlier this year that 9 million people with low scores have already been blocked from buying tickets for domestic flights in China, trains as well. And this fear of taking a hit to your social credit score is stopping undesirable social gatherings from happening in both public and private spaces. It's rate limiting internet speeds for certain citizens. It's restricting access to restaurants and hotels and elite schools to those with a very high score. It's regulating access to certain perks on dating websites and a lot more. And on the flip side, those with really good scores are being rewarded with discounted energy bills and better loans, access to better jobs and faster bureaucratic service. The 2014 government outline of the project, which I just read pretty recently, says a lot of things, but this one was interesting. A shame-filled atmosphere makes honesty and trustworthiness the norm for the conscious behavior of the whole people. So behind the obvious things I've already mentioned, this is also playing out in like really unpredictable ways if you live in China, at least certain parts of China right now. If you want to play the really popular online video game Counter-Strike Global Offensive, you have to log in with your ID for the game, but also your national ID. 
And if you play up to the, you know, over 10 hours, it starts to penalize your social credit score. And if you use mods to cheat, it also penalizes your social credit score. Also, in a bid to reduce wait times by up to 60%, Sesame Credit, which is one of the private companies, is letting users with a score above 650 see a doctor without lining up to pay and more. And this sort of merging of our offline behavior into the infosphere of the online world and the gamification of our real life behavior, to me, the potential for this is an absolute horror, sort of the ultimate in extrinsic motivation of our behavior. Sort of a lifelong parent watching over your shoulder, rewarding or punishing you for your everyday choices. It's like the infantilism of helicopter parenting mashed up with the inescapable fists of autocratic power. What is this going to do to the self, to this frontier of the world within us, to us knowing ourselves, living from that, and acting from that? And where is the metaphorical privacy of the home, right, where all the technologies that help us live with ourselves and harbor us and refuge us from the outside world? Number 13, outcomes. As we all know and experience, these days we live as much in a media environment as we do a physical environment. So it's no surprise that the media of our buildings, the images and videos and theory, that this shapes our, you know, what the profession of architecture values. And that's by no means unique to architecture. But it seems to me especially problematic in architecture. Sure, images may bias high fashion towards visual expression over how it feels to wear something, and that's not ideal but a good chunk of fashion is really the visual language of self-expression. Well, architecture, sure, it's a visual language, but most of it is this four-dimensional built environment that we have to live in every day. And doing that and evaluating that by what looks good is a simple and obvious form of insanity to me. Many of the best parts of my favorite building aren't visual at all. With the way the rain sounds on the roof in the sunroom, or the social energy I was showing you fostered in the workspace outside my house, or my office. Or the, the daily rituals of my neighbor Bob in San Francisco, who's lived there in the same house for 60 years. I don't have a photo of Bob, but I assure you he exists. Now, I do hear critiques, of course, of the impact of visual media on architecture. But I don't hear much about plausible alternatives, and it's possible I'm not listening closely enough. And I'm not knowledgeable today about uh, not, not knowledgeable enough about architectural practice to suggest a solution or different course of action, but I would like to take a minute to play with other ways of relating to buildings. To me as a client, at least, the 99% of a building's lifespan that matters is the practices that are enabled within the building after initial construction, what's called post-occupancy. And yet, how much involvement do we get to have as architects in that lifespan of the building? How much accountability is there for architects after the handover? I'm asking because I actually don't really know, but I can say as a client that clients do a really poor job of thinking about this. We tend to spend most of the money we have on the build out and don't leave a lot for substantive post-occupancy improvements. And I'm just curious if the building industry has ever seriously considered architectural engagements, contractor engagements that last for a longer period of time, and if that would actually save money by being more efficient. It's interesting to me because consumer internets are a fascinating contrast here. For all consumer internet care companies care about, to a fault sometimes, is the ongoing behavior of our users and customers, it is what would be called the post-occupancy phase of digital spaces. And at best, this enables internet companies to measure and learn and iterate until the architecture of these digital services is really well optimized to the needs of the users. And at worst, it enables internet companies to sometimes manipulate the behavior of users on a, on a pretty big scale by building digital experiences that prey on really basic instincts, something that Pinterest works hard not to do. But so what can architects learn from this contrast? Well, I'm not sure, but let's do a simple thought experiment. Let's pretend to design a home using the methods of basic consumer internet company product development. Let's say this is a typical one bedroom apartment it looks too big to be in New York. Um, now let's optimize this for the desired user behavior. Eating and working and sleeping, those are all productive behaviors. And maybe time spent looking at media is something we value. So I kind of got to this. I've made a few uh, bold design decisions here. First, I made one wall a screen. And then I positioned the key furniture and fixtures, the bathtub, the toilet, and the pull-out sofa so that they face the screen at all times. That leaves little time 
Little time moving about, wasted. Next, I replace the kitchen with a quite innovative food chute that delivers food anytime you wish. And finally, to make sure we really capture as much engaging user behavior as possible, I used to, uh, did a bunch of experiments to prove that if you remove the door to the apartment, it helps people not waste time out in the world. <laughs> and when we A-B these tests, uh, when we A-B these changes against our control, the original apartment, we see a significant increase in the healthy spectrum of user behaviors, time sleeping, time defecating, time watching media, and significant decreases in extraneous non-productive behaviors like time cooking or time moving about or time cleaning or more. And we think this really puts users first. Now, of course, that's exaggerated for satirical effect. These companies are a lot smarter than that. They really, really are. They would never ship that. But at the same time, what I'm trying to make a point here is that I can say with confidence that the form of our digital spaces is incredibly biased by what we can measure with today's technology. It's, it's really biased towards how people behave in certain ways. And the same industry is very ineffectual at building what, against what isn't measurable doesn't understand why people use, behave in certain ways, and it's not very good to understand what people feel on their services or why. And so the impact of digital spaces on the overall offline well-being of the user is highly biased towards what is measurable. Now, I want to ask you architects a question. Was that new home design good or bad? I don't know. Why? Why was it good or bad? Was it bad because the lives that were lived there were not good lives? But when have architects as a profession spent much time as a whole investing their energy in actually understanding the quality of the lives lived in their spaces? So the question for me is, if the lives in a home are good, is the architecture good? Or if the lives in a home are bad, is the architecture bad? So on one hand, I belittle architecture for abdicating their responsibility over how environments affect people. On the other hand, I belittle tech companies for focusing on only on what's measurable and being blind to what they can't measure. So what am I suggesting? I think all I'm suggesting is that architecture tries to define itself more as the shaping of spaces that enable healthy practices of living and working, and that architects measure the outcomes of the spaces they build and treat that data that they're measuring with appropriate skepticism. And I'm suggesting that consumer internet companies do the same thing. I'm suggesting that whether you're an architect of digital space or a physical space, we have an ethical responsibility to make sure that we're creating environments that empower and enable people in ways that celebrate their individuality. And as someone who enjoys the beauty that we get to make as architects and designers, sometimes it's really painful for me to have to focus on less aesthetic problems at work. But I've come to realize, meeting so many users, that that sacrifice is very well worth making. All right, number 14, defend the home. This is my rat terrier, Felix. He's good at three things. He's good at snuggling. He's good at disking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he's good at defending the home. As architects, we all know that home is more than a building. It's a state of mind. And there's a reason kids draw homes. Home is your private space. It's literally and metaphorically a private space where you feel safe to relax and be yourself, to define what being the self, yourself means. Homes are one of the few products in our lives that have resisted this sort of crazy business logic of mass branding. Perhaps the dream being that one day we'll be able to live in a house that really reflects our individual sensibilities. But just because you live in a home doesn't mean, or a house doesn't mean you live in a home. And obviously in architecture, a lot of thought is given to public and private space and how to demarcate the two and secure their boundaries and amplify the psychology of each. And a lot of thought is given to how physical decisions translate into physiological decisions. This is something that Felix does really well. He was born with an innate sense of his home, literally and metaphorically, if my brother, who he likes more than me, is outside, he yelps with glee. And if anyone else is outside, he barks and howls in warning. And this sense of boundary is visceral for Felix. And he didn't learn this. He wasn't taught this. He was born with it. And I'll tell you, no amount of great training takes it away. 
And as a species, we humans, we really share this psychological need to defend our home, to balance life spent out in public with time spent recharging in private. And as our environments become more digital, as photos of our friends follow us into the most private spaces of our lives, the bedroom and the bathroom, it's really changing the psychological reality of how we live. Is this nose totally distracting you? To me, it's not surprising that the age of the internet is the age of connection. But the extent is truly unbelievable. A recent study shows that we check our phones up to 150 times a day. So we are now incredibly connected to what's happening with friends and family, what's happening in the news, what's happening with celebrities. Our phones are giving us access to the world, but in turn, the world now has access to us. All of, the, all of that news, all of those emails, alerts, and texts are coming at us all the time, no matter where we go. And that's just kind of how life is today in today's world. But for a lot of people, it's a lot. I travel quite a bit to meet with users where they live. I'm going to Iowa on Monday to do that and talk to them about the internet and the phone and Pinterest and what they love and what they hate. And so many of them share this sense, whether it's conscious or not, but all of this constant connection is actually disconnecting us from what matters to us. It's not universal, but it's very, very common that people feel overwhelmed and a little stressed by everything going on outside. And the theme that comes up over and over again in my conversations is that the hidden costs of connection to the world is a disconnection to the self. Disconnection from our own personal dreams, from maybe what we value, from our tastes, from how we're feeling every day. There are so many products now to connect us with what's happening in the world. But where are the products to help us stay connected to ourselves? And it's funny because we regularly give children kinds of those kinds of products, toys, educational materials, classes, to help them grow and learn about themselves and gain competency. But as adults, we don't even realize often that we have that need to connect with ourselves. In a way, our society, from my lens, meeting with people, is that we're losing touch with our home. And we're losing touch with the fact that time spent in private space on what you want to do isn't just a luxury or a privilege. It's actually a fundamental psychological human need. It's a mammalian need, if you think about Felix. And so number 15, dreams. A few blocks from my home in San Francisco is a row of houses. It's called the Painted Ladies. It's a so famous by the show that in the year 2011 there was a bus of angel posts driving out of houses once every three minutes. And this prompted the local residents to come together and ban all tour buses on the street. What great power these houses have to be able to physically divert hundreds of thousands of people in a year to look at their image. What an example of the power that images and symbols have in our psychological experience of being alive. What power they have to remake our physical world. And so I wonder, what are our cultures, pop culture, most famous homes? I don't know the answer to that. I don't have time to really dig into it, but some came to mind for me personally, given where I grew up. It's the Cosby Show house. It's Elvis's Graceland. Is that apartment from Friends? It's a Kardashian home. <laughs> Not actually their home. There's the Sex in the City brownstone. It's the modern family homes. This is the Bachelor and Bachelorette Mansion. And then I was like, let's take a look at who actually builds the most homes in the US. I think it's this company called DR Norton. And when you visit their website, this is their marquee image. <laughs> I'm serious, go to drhorton.com. Images are the language of dreams. And many of the public's images of architecture are being produced not by architects, but by other kinds of image makers, like celebrities or marketers or home developers, or the producers in film and television. And looking at the dreams that these image makers share with the public that seem to appeal to the public, you see images of a home that, maybe like the Eames home, embraces the messiness of living. It's called well-worn interiors. Comfortable family and friends. This familiar scaffolding for hundreds or thousands of stories. Spaces filled with the drama of human life. 
And no offense to us architects, but I do not see us as the expert dream shapers, or even the experts on the home. In many ways, we've abdicated our agency here in shaping the architectural dreams of society. Instead, we mostly focus, at least at this level, on monuments of global tourism and art and theory, all of which are beautiful extensions of, extensions of human creativity. But I'd also like us, as a profession, to have more impact on the buildings most folks live in. And that might just be because I've been bit by this bug of scale that comes with working on the internet. But I'd like us to remember the role we could be playing, satisfying and celebrating the most fundamental human need for, for shelter. Because architecture school, as you all know, isn't just, an applied, isn't just an academic program, it's an applied craft school. And when I was a student here, we used to have a keg every Friday up on the landing. You guys still do that? Yes? It's the first week, I guess you don't know. Um, it was the highlight of the week. But we also knew that if we were feeling good on Thursday, we wanted free food or liquor, we could sneak across to the business school which had this incredible larder um, paid for by that half billion dollar endowment of meats and cheeses and hard liquors <laughs> and LCD screens. And it was really wonderful as an architecture student. But I'll tell you what, uh, running a business now, the graduates of that school, for better or for worse, are gonna go on to impact a lot of the world's largest businesses and ultimately the dreams and perceptions of a lot of our countries and maybe the world citizens. And I want us to challenge ourselves, what percentage of real world homes are we gonna be it's architecture graduates impacting. I don't know the answer to that, it's up to you. But I'd say looking at the images or dreams that I encounter in culture, it feels like we could be having a much bigger impact on that. And the world really needs us to do that because dreams are not just trivial imaginings. Our dreams are manifestations of who we are and who we aspire to be. They reflect the self and they shape who we are, they shape the self. And I'll tell you, when we're able to align our dreams with who we are inside and what we value, we become more caring and generous, and empathetic and purposeful and effective. And in a society to me that very quickly appears to be losing its sense of control and ease in the home, we have a real chance to help empower and enable people to dream in a way that nourishes the self much more actively. Because we as image makers now have unprecedented tools for visualizing dreams. And we also have platforms on which to share those dreams like never before. And as architects and designers and creatives, we in this room are experts in this visual language of dreams, at reading it and speaking it and using it to inspire action. So what dreams could we be reaving? And what dreams do we want people to aspire to? A house is a building and a home is much more of a garden. It's a way of relating. And home, of course, is soil for the self and by extension, soil for society. And as democratic citizens, we all have a responsibility to care for that soil. And as architects, we have the chance to make it much richer. And when architects show up willing to own the full outcomes of the work they ship in the world, I think we're gonna find that we have the power to shape the collective dreams of the future much more than we realize today. Because we must defend the home to be like Felix. We have to use our expertise drawing images to create images of a balanced future. Because if words are the language of knowledge, images are the language of dreams. And we have an acute need in our society today for a moral dream, a vision of the future that inspires action against the biggest problems of our time. But the trick is that vision must include everybody, especially the people you don't want it to include. It must unite across these divisions that are sharpening so quickly right now. It must be bold but it must be achievable and it must be told to everybody. And in my, opinion, in my opinion, this uniting vision is not gonna describe the world. It's actually gonna describe the one problem everyone in society shares, and that's the need for better relations with our a healthier inner world as human beings. So let's remind people that home is a garden, it's a mindset, it's a spiritual practice that never ends, it's about the journey. That in order to build a great home, you don't need to be an architect, you just need to love yourself and find a way to love your neighbor. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Evan. That was amazing. Sure. <laughs> and an amazing uh, first... Uh, uh, like 
lecture also. Um, I'm supposed to be uh, giving a, a response, but I mostly want to open it up to the audience. But before, oh, sure. I wanted to just, uh, first of all, I really appreciate it. Um, you forgot to mention your philosopher in, in the multi year. <laughs> I was uh, and an incredible storyteller, um, and it was beautifully told as a story, and the Thank chapters you. were incredibly well written and uh, sort of composed, and, and storytelling is really what we're missing right now mm. to connect the dots and, uh, and the kind of movement that you did between the kind of personal and the sort of universal is also this connection that we're somehow missing or, or, or unable to make uh, in meaningful ways often today. Um, personally, you know, I was, you took me back to, uh, you know, my uh, fascination with Descartes and the Cartesian mm. split between mind and body, you mm. know, that and enlightenment and the, you know, the I actually don't know what you're talking about. I should go read that. <laughs> <laughs> so Descartes was, uh, you know, this uh, very interesting French philosopher. Uh, and in France, mm. you know, when you get educated, they want to put you in a little Cartesian box. I and see. Uh, and he he said, uh, you know, uh, je pense, uh, donc je suis, I think, therefore mm. I am. And it was the kind of mm. beginning of the split between uh, being as only a result of thought and not as a result of your physical embodiment. Mm. Uh, and it took me back to, you know, the debate between Voltaire and Rousseau. Voltaire said mm -hmm. what you said you have to cultivate your mm. garden. And mm. he was about culture. And Rousseau said, no, you just, you know, if you just can feel alive uh, and just let yourself drift, um, that's enough. And he was about nature. And this kind of split, you know, keeps going on. Anyway, I, I just wanted to just share that your kind of thinking brought um, all these kind of splits that we try to mm. bring back together to create connection. and. And that was kind of very um, uh, sort of inspiring uh, to think about, um, you know, the house and the city, the home and the garden. And, and uh, um, anyway, uh, of course, I was very um, traumatized by your China <laughs> uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, chapter, uh, which is, you know, um, and... Uh, and I'll just say most of that is from two articles I found in Wired. I'd heard about it. So I haven't done rigorous research, yeah. but that's what Wired says. Um, that's how we work now, right? Especially when we're pursuing other things. But yeah. I, I, it sounds like it's very much on the path to being what it sounds like. Well, I think it's, it's it just uh, beyond that moment is this kind of dark side that we're seeing. I mean, that yeah. is maybe one extreme, but in general, you know, I think the sense that um, uh, people are both um, obsessed in very open-ended ways about the question of identity and hybridity mm -hmm. and complexity, and at the same time so fearful of that loss of boundary that, um, you know, the conversations we are, uh, you know, caught within now um, in terms of immigration and, 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 you know, are very... Anyway, I'm just... Um, Kind of, kind of inspired uh, by your your talk and all that it's uh, opening up as um, uh, old ideas that we have to kind of bring uh, anew. Um, and wanted to thank you for kind of sure, sharing those uh, with us tonight, um, opening it up to our students and the audience and Troy. Oh, Troy. Hey, Troy. Troy was my TA first studio, and then my second studio. <laughs> Thank you, Troy. Hi, Evan. Hi. Welcome back. <laughs> and a good friend. Uh, yeah, so uh, there's, a, there's a kind of, uh, there's a blog called Ribbon Farm. It has a kind of cult following in Silicon Valley. There was, there was a post on it, uh, I think a few months ago. It was called, um, uh, the premium mediocre life of Maya Millennial. And, and it introduced this term premium mediocre, and it was basically a kind of, uh, I don't know, like a philosophy of like taking premium, premium economy seats on an airplane 
and turning it into a kind of like new category mm -hmm. of uh, uh, product. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think um, uh, also a kind of a product that one would buy to construct their own identity. Mm. Um, and what was, so I, I, you know, it was kind of like eating up social media and becoming like a meme. And I, I sent it to a friend of mine who's a, uh, is like a middle-aged uh, kind of, like a Gen X kind of bourgeois German journalist. And so he wrote about it in like the New York Times of Germany, this profile, and he got like all this traction and people got like really excited in Germany. And when I read the translation, it was interesting because from his point of view, it was like, this is a new category of consumption. That's interesting. Um, but what the story was really about was that Maya Millennial um, was the character, and Maya Millennial sits premium, premium economy on a plane, which she can't really afford, because she has a bunch of student debt, and she doesn't own property because she was born after 1980, and that's what life is like now. Um, and, but what she did was she, she would buy premium economy stuff. Uh, she would get, you know, like, like, I don't know, like quilted toilet paper or whatever, and, and the whole point was just to, to present an image to her parents mm that everything's still okay. It's not, mm. it's pretty bad. And for, for the generation that she's in and future generations, it's like kind of get, resources are getting more tightly constrained and so on. Um, but it was about presenting this image to the previous generation, don't worry, it's gonna be fine. I don't wanna freak you mm. out. Mm. And, um, but of course, the, the culture that's developing amongst you know, the tail end of the millennials and even the Gen, Gen Z or whatever you wanna call them, uh, it feels like, there, uh, for me, the Maya Millennial story and, and like having a, a, a kind of Gen Xer try to interpret it and just totally miss the mark um, is really, like uh, for me, the kind of nutshell of my, my personal experience in the last year or so is that the, the generational kind of stratification of culture is so thick, yeah. right? And um, th there's, well, so there, there's a course that I'm teaching here now that's basically on, on magic because I feel like this millennial generation and younger are living in a world where the systems that were set up to, to provide kind of civic structure have failed them. Um, and as a result, they're turning completely outside of them. So to go back, so, so, so one of the memes of this kind of younger generation goes back to Descartes, but it's talking about Descartes as sort of like the, 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 the Cartesian lobotomy, because it's really about, I think, um, kind of recovering almost an earlier kind of uh, 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 metaphysics, um, an animist metaphysics. And it's incredible to me, I, I, you know, I go to like an art opening and there's like all these kids with like cool kids with like blue hair and they're talking about like uh, uh, Latin American anthropologists that are developing like new perspectivalist uh, uh, perspectives on uh, uh, magical thinking. And I guess I'm curious, so, so sorry, really long thing, but the question is, uh, you talk about spirit. Mm. And I find when I talk to like uh, peers my, my age and older, spirit is a metaphor. When I talk to my mm -hmm. students today and younger, mm. spirit is a thing. Mm. So I'm curious for you, like how, how literal, you know, sorry to call you out in a public forum, no. but how, how literally do you mean spirit? I mean, I think spirit is a word that for me I'm growing to meet. It's like a word that you learn, but you don't really know what it means in a way. At least I didn't. And um, not until you feel it. Not until you feel it. That's right. I did this retreat earlier this year. It's like that thing I wrote, and one of my friends from the retreat, Hi Penny, is here. Um, but it, it, it's it was it was really about finding. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't, these, so I took out a section of the talk because I was going over about how the language of the self is really missing. At least for me, and the way I was raised, we don't have good frameworks to describe the dynamics we experience. Because of that, we don't feel them very often unless there's an extreme problem, and then it's a catastrophe we've got to solve. And I think for me, spirit was something that I've always had, but I haven't really known how to understand or feel. And now it's something that I can do. I can check in, and it's, it's really a label for myself. What do I want? How do I feel? It's sort of the unprogrammed version of myself. Um, and it's thinking about that concept and trying to live from that concept, even if it's just a psychological trick, has been incredibly powerful for me over the last year. Um, and I just want to comment quickly on your first point, because I remember when I graduated from college as a millennial in debt, I remember going to Target, and my, my wife has really good taste, and I was so scared, because I was like, she's going to buy nice stuff. And I had like $200 in the bank account. And she, you know, she like put like three hundred dollars of the stuff in there because you know, I mean, in a good way. One of the values we have is like, don't buy stupid stuff you're gonna throw away. But when you're broke, it's hard to live from that and also afford the everyday stuff. 
But I don't really have anything pithy to say about that generational divide other than, man, is that real? A man is that having a huge impact on how everyone experiences their lives in ways we probably don't even understand cross-generationally. You have great students, Troy. <laughs> Hi, Evan. Hey, Penny. <laughs> it's true. We met at a retreat. <laughs> uh, a retreat about connection. Yeah. Um, and so I have a question for you about when you talked about connection, what do you feel oh, fuck. or yeah. do you feel that you have a responsibility as someone who yeah. is at the helm of something to help people understand what that means? Right now, it's a garden meaning my understanding is changing over time, hopefully getting better. And what I understand is I need my platform to empower and enable people individually and inspire them as much as possible. And the way we measure that is through user behavior and also investing a lot of time in talking to people to try and understand how they're experiencing the platform and whether it's doing that or not. And that's what I'm working on right now, you know, is to try and turn the service we have into an example of a service with a strong ethical foundation that audits itself against that foundation publicly eventually and can serve as an example for other companies. Because I think there's a lot of desire you know, in the Valley to have good outcomes. People aren't out to like screw everybody over. Um, and I would also say as someone who runs a company, the talent in technology is the most valuable thing. And so if you have a company that doesn't have a, a good purpose or has an unethical purpose, you're gonna lose a lot of really good people. So everyone wants to do the right thing, the trick is what is it? And how do you measure that? And it's really complicated. And right now the only answer I have is I'm working on, on Pinterest and making that healthy. I was speaking more like personal connection though. Do you feel oh. like a PSA? I don't know, I mean I was just curious if you felt like there was a platform from where you are to really kind of help people understand what it means to be personally connected to self. Yeah, um, I, I wrestle with that. I think what, what I heard from you was like, should I be talking up a little bit? Um, what I'm trying to do right now is, is uh, be an example and make sure that I know what I'm talking about because it's, it'd be, it's relatively easy to tear down and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not helpful at this point because I think tearing down doesn't construct anything meaningful. So I'm trying to learn how to construct something meaningful, and hopefully if that works, then yes, I'd love to have a huge platform. I just hire a CMO, because CMOs are good at getting stories out there, so hopefully that helps. Hi, Evan. Hey, what's up? Thanks for coming back. Yeah. Um, I'm not gonna beat around the bush, because the previous question kind of tiptoed on mine. Not about your responsibility in terms of censorship, hmm. what you do with a white supremacist board or weaponry boards and how you tackle that, but my, college roommate who is also in the web world always says when he comes to my office man you are so regulated so a what regulated oh regulated from ada compliance to egress mm. to fire life safety when we design out there not in academia but every day at our desks it's meeting layer upon layer of mandate your world is largely unregulated as mm. of yet and mm -hmm. I think it falls on your own shoulders to make those regulations, those decisions, free speech or not. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you feel about the fact that mm -hmm. Silicon Valley is resistant to that regulation, but in a way it burdens you with making those choices? And also in some ways, my friend would say, separates you from being a profession like architecture, information architect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how I feel, to be really candid. Um, I don't know how I feel. I don't know what would lead to the best outcome for people right now. I think what's important is we try something. I wish I had like a better answer, you know, but um, regulation could help. Companies doing a better job internally could help. What I will say is all the companies I know of, and I'm pretty focused on Pinterest because it's pretty intense, are investing a lot in trying to build healthier information services. Will it succeed or not? I don't know, we'll find out. I'm optimistic, but that's because I'm in technology and it's kind of the feeling in technology is optimism. But like any, the last thing I'll say is like any industry, over time you get more regulated. That's how it works, that's how it should work. Hello. Hi, first of all, thank you for your time. Um, after listening to your lecture about the power of the image and 
it, that it could represent dreams and us as architects and designers should maybe aspire to design um, a certain quality of home or living. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is that we live in an age where websites such as the one you, you created give people who aren't necessarily designers the power to collect these powerful images mm. into collections that become sort of their dreams and their aspirations. Um, so I kind of wanted to know, what's your opinion on the fact that maybe that sense of home mm. or dream or part of life nowadays can actually not only be represented in physical architectural mm. space, but that part of my part of my conception of home can actually be on online on websites such as yours. Totally. Um, it's really beautiful uh, description of the best parts uh, of Pinterest. I took out a section kind of just similar to what you just said too. <laughs> but yeah, I think the, um, you know, we spend a lot of our lives in digital spaces now. And so the psychological impact of how a digital space is, is enabling you to feel is a big part of how healthy we are every day. And the role that Pinterest seems to be playing for a lot of people, not everybody, is it's maybe the one place on their phone that they go to regularly that's about them. It's about their future, their life. One of my favorite metaphors for it is it's sort of like Lego. It's like a construction set where you assemble things. You know, and if Lego is about assembling imaginary worlds that you inhabit, you know, and make narratives out of as kids, Pinterest is about trying to construct a dream world. And then when we do our job really well, which doesn't always happen, those dreams become your real life. And you act on some of them, you cook stuff, you do stuff, you get offline. So we're always trying to understand how we show you ideas to inspire you and give you that inspirational energy to get offline and do them in real life. But your point that that feeling when you're on the service, if it feels like home can be really healthy, I think is really smart and really true in my experience, talking to people. So as a company, um, you do have a certain initiative or vision in connecting these two homes and these two realities that are surging in our... Well, yeah, I think a lot of people use Pinterest literally to design home decor ideas, you know, to figure out what they want in their life, to play with what they could be, what their taste might look like. And that's really cool um, and really powerful. And then I'm literally in this project right now to try and bring a clearer story to the company of how psychologically being on Pinterest feels to a lot of people. And it does, it is varied depending on what you're using it for. But for a lot of people, it does feel like a personal retreat or refuge. It's like the place they go to relax before bed, or it's where they go in the morning to feel kind of excited and inspired for the day. And that's very different than social media, which is usually about what other people are doing, which is about what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, thank you, for hey. The, hey, thank you for the talk. Uh, it's really fantastic. It's really uh, fantastic to know that the status of education of architecture allows for, you know, other professions to emerge out of architecture, or at least out of the education of architecture. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you're a great uh, story for, I think, you know, the oh, thank education. You. I, I have a, a question about uh, the notion of norm. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, normal is such an interesting and, you know, constantly moving, shifting target. Mm -hmm. uh, every year something changes uh, in our understanding of normalcy. So the speed of norm, uh, I, I don't know if it accelerates over time or decelerates over time, but uh, you uh, are a revealer of norm. Mm. Like you're, that you construct a, a platform uh, that reveals normalcy, uh, what people are interested in or not interested in, uh, mm -hmm. you know, through a quantifiable amassing, we would know what's normal. So as a distant observer, I feel like I'm able to kind of see when, uh, you know, things, when things change in terms of its uh, normalcy. But I'm really curious about you and your observation being sort of in the driver's seat, mm. you know, being a person who constructed such a platform for, for the revealing of normalcy. What have you, what are some of the kind of key mm. um, experiences that you've had about, it, about this? No. Um, we're just starting to understand uh, the way trends start and stop and what that means. Trends kind of look, I, my sense is mathematically, they look like traffic almost, it's sort of like all these, interst all these components interacting and hitting each other, and it's really hard to say that's the theme. There are exceptions to that, um, but it's really hard to say this is why one kind of normalcy developed or not. At least today, it's hard for us to figure that out. 
I don't know, Pinterest plays a role in both directions. I don't know how much in either. You know, on one hand, you search for something and you see the most popular results, and that creates a norming feeling. On the other hand, you can find anything you want, and the home feed is highly personalized, and a lot of people use it to develop an abnormal sense of aesthetic. So it's a great question, and I haven't thought much about it. <laughs> um, th thank, you. thank you for your lecture. I um, actually... I think in the past year I've seen um, people from like Warby Parker or mm -hmm. uh, Muji come speak at Harvard and I feel like you're also part of the same vein of technology um, kind of leaders going to architecture school and sort of showing an alternative sort of outcome of how architecture school can, can lead to these other fields. So I think that's great. Um, I, I, I agree with a previous comment someone said where I think Pinterest has empowered a lot of non-designers to be able to start customizing their lives and to create those dreams. But I also have a, being in, you know, in, in practice, I also see that there's also been a lot of misuse and abuse of Pinterest. In that, you know, the rise of Pinterest has led to, you know, um, the sort of, <laughs> flattening and standardization of, of these trends uh, hmm. where like I think a lot of people see the most popular Pinterest feeds and all the developers and all the clients start to want the same thing hmm. and so there's been a sort of flattening standardization and I'm curious if your team has, has thought about that and how to keep Pinterest as diverse as possible hmm. um, do you feel like Pinterest has made design more efficient or, 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 or more boring in a way I actually disagree with what you say about Pinterest. Um, I'm not saying there isn't some truth to it, but I was meeting with a big furniture company this morning randomly, and all they were talking about is how much more diverse tastes have become in the last five years. I mean, maybe not Pinterest, but just in general, and how that just means it's hard for them because they have so many things to keep track of in their warehouse. And so, you know, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to ascribe causality to a single platform or other, but I'll definitely say the internet is having both a normalization and a very diversifying effect. On Pinterest, we think a lot about how we show you diverse reasons to use the service. And so there's a homepage that's personalized to what you seem to be liking recently and to your tastes. And we try and make sure we're always showing you something a little different so that maybe it's pushing you in a different direction. Um, and that's pretty important, but we also want to show you stuff that's relevant so it's useful. And so that's a balance that we're always working on and measuring, and we measure that quantitatively, and then we also talk to people. And right now, I think it's kind of too responsive to your behavior. As an example, if you search for something and then you go to your home feed, like you search for like instant pot recipe, and then you go to your home feed and it's like half instant pot, you're like, that's not really what I wanted. But so we're constantly tuning the way it selects the ideas you see in your home feed to try and balance diversity and and personalization. I assume it's AI machine learning that we're going to do in section eight. Yes. The, the premiation of vision in, in the history of art in various ways, and I'm always bringing up mind, body, split, and Descartes, et cetera. But uh, the, the, point, the simple point is um, when, when, when the coding starts to work through color and everything mm -hmm. else, of yeah. course, I assume it's still kind of structuralist coding, meaning there are words behind the That's coding. That's right. It's biased So red is language. still called red. Yes. So it's, it's a word before it's a color. Yes. And it's a word before it's an optic experience. Maybe, I don't know. But, yeah. but it struck me as like a wildly, wildly interesting, just partially in response to your question before, when things start to get sorted and presented in ways that precede language, mm -hmm. and thereby mm -hmm. will go somewhere different than language might have taken you. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, chiaroscura is part of it suddenly, and shade, and shadow, and light, and color, and heat, and then, and then, you know, then it's red, and it's heat, and it's thermal. And then maybe it starts to go to blankets. Um, I don't know. Uh, to me, that seems to be like an advent. It is. I'm I'll sure say. You, oh. I know you're working on. I know Pinterest. Is, yeah. But coding is notoriously structural, I believe, uh, structuralist. And the degree to which you would start to get past the structuralism that's in coding through machine learning, which still ultimately is structuralist. It's just fast structuralism, I guess. Um, anyway, the question would be, you must be thrilled by that because maybe that's the way hmm. to get past some of that more reductive sorting, even though it's not so reductive. 
That you guys are on the verge of launching that kind of. Yeah, you know, we it's called computer vision. So it's an application of machine learning, and I'm not a machine learning engineer, but I work with a lot of them. So my understanding is kind of more conceptual than applied. You're a philosopher of the self. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> um, but one thing we've done recently that's interesting, and I might butcher this, but I think I understand it, is um, use machine learning to create what's called embeddings, which is a mathematical understanding. And the processes were all developed to understand language mathematically, but we've applied them to visual media without words. And so we have a mathematical understanding of what parts of images are and how they overlap and how they relate without any words involved. And then you can go in and label them later. And But that's powering, like, if you look at an image right, on so Pinterest and scroll after, down. And then maybe we're discussing something completely different than we would have done if we were using language. Yes. 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 Like, if you look at an image and scroll down, you see related images. And that's, you know, the, what, what picks those is it, it's a lot of different things go into that. But a big thing is visual embeddings, visual signals. And they're interesting because they're very subjective, you know taste, preference, a lot of that stuff is visual information that no one's really structured, and that's one of the things we're capable of doing, well, good and bad. Not, not to stay on here, but when the camera's zooming in and out on the dog, Spark, whatever your dog's name was. Um, uh, his name is Felix. <laughs> <laughs> no. anyway, th thank you for an amazing Sure, time. sure, yeah, yeah. Should we take one, la one last question? Yeah. Uh, I, I have the microphone, and, and if, if I may pass it to whoever had it back there before it. I, I have a very short question. Sure. Um, just to say, first of all, thank you for speaking with a lot of love and curiosity mm. uh, about things that are both cerebral and felt. Thank you. And thank you for the reminder to um, ask questions I don't know the answers to. Um, I was taking notes, and I found myself writing down in parentheses, democracy guy, which I mm. had not expected when I arrived. Me neither. The evening. <laughs> well, no, I, but I, what I, I want to ask you is, um, in the same way that you mentioned the national parks, and mm. that feels actually foundational, perhaps, to your, your ethos as a person, if you could talk about democracy, either um, for you personally, in terms of what it means to love yourself and love your neighbor, or in terms of what that means technologically and architecturally, for Pinterest. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. I don't think I've thought enough about government. Um, it's, I probably should have, but. Um, and I don't mean to put words no, 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 no. I use the word democracy guy. No, it's use democracy. Um, what, okay, here's something that I think is interesting. You know that, like, I don't know if you're here for the beginning, but there's like three dimensional versus four dimensional <laughs> basic thing. But there's this notion in democracy, right, that like the, the, the collective has its own agency. And if you think about it, there's actually a, a huge, there's a huge autocracy built in democracy in that you're always under the thumb of every generation in front of you. It's interesting to think what would a set of laws look like that, um, that um, um, preserved the rights of all generations of citizens and how might that change what's regulated? I have no idea what that even means, but that's something that's pretty interesting to me. And then I would just say I do feel personally um, a responsibility to try and be an active citizen within the confines of reality. And um, it's especially important, given that so few people do that today. OK. I guess I have the last question. Um, Thank you. So uh, I was really interested by um, your topic talking about how digital platforms are biased toward things that they can measure. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking back to something that actually Dean Andrau said during the all school orientation, or at some point, about GSEP having a minor curriculum breakdown between the worlds of visualization and um, technology, mm. in that these two worlds are very quickly colliding. At, data visualization has become a very key component of not only architecture, but our mm. society in general. Um, and so I was interested. Um, especially in the context of, of companies like Facebook and Twitter and perhaps even your own, having immense amounts of data about people, yeah. what is the next presently unmeasurable factor that would change how your platform operates today? That's a great question. Um, well, you know, what's coming, for better or for worse, is the ability to measure how people feel. And that's happening in lots of different ways. Um, measuring the emotion in videos and images, measuring how people feel through surveys. I mean, the nightmare scenario would be, you know, apps could measure how your face looks like when you use them. 
And thank God, like, there's Apple out there who wouldn't allow that to happen through their APIs, but that's not at all implausible. I don't think it's going to happen. I think we're going to not let that happen, but um, how people feel is so powerful. And so I'm, I'm really scared because on one hand, measuring how people feel could lead to much better outcomes for users. You could make healthier services. And on the other hand, it could lead to mass manipulation, even more than we have today. So that's an example of a capability, a change that's coming. And you know, the difference to me between design and engineering as a role, not as a label of a person, but as a role, is engineering is about capability, you know, what you could do with technology, and design is about suitability, what we should do. So we need to figure out how you design things like measuring your emotions so that when we have that capability, maybe it's regulation or maybe it's just something about the values of the companies, that capability, if we unlock it, is used for better outcomes for people over time, not more manipulative ones. So I evaded your question, but that's, that's kind of the thing that it comes to mind question. when you ask what we, what we, I mean, what I want to know is, is your life better or worse? And that's very subjective because a lot of what happens is offline and it's really complicated. But hopefully you're feeling empowered, hopefully you're feeling inspired, and hopefully you're feeling enabled to do what you want to do and living from who you really are inside more than you were before you used the service. And anything we can do to measure that, I think is helping us stay on the right path over time. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, Thank you for Evan. staying, guys. Thank, Thank you. you.